but don't hold on to it back to the beginning of the talk about concretized metaphor. If we don't make it a concrete, a concrete, well, that's just the way it is and lay the judgment, but allow ourselves the openness to let that imagination then be informed by more and more stories and other people's imaginations. Now, a huge opportunity. Guys, I'm super excited to introduce you to Ben Dennis. Ben is someone that got put on my radar by a mutual friend, Ted Rubin, who's also been on the Ripple Effect podcast. I was watching Ted's um, ski vacation where he was actually uh, skiing with Ben. And Ted had alluded to several times that Ben was in his thoughts or he was writing and just um, captured a couple of these moments. So I asked Ted about it and he said, yo, you, you would love Ben. He's a, he's a high level thinker. He's, he's a really interesting guy. And I said, I'd love to meet him. And so we had a conversation and I just knew after having that conversation, he's someone that I needed to bring on the podcast. He is such an incredible individual. He's a, uh, he was a first responder as a fireman. Uh, he's been in the military. He is a uh, professor uh, adjunct at uh, a university. And from his website, this is a little bit of his description. Ben is a mytho mythologist. It's a hard word for me to say. And writer cultivating an ongoing lifelong love of story, myth, and psychology. He is passionately involved in ritual, rites of passage, psychodrama, and storytelling. His mythic interests include Greek mythology, Native American story, European fairy tale, and Hindu epic literature. When he and I talked, we talked about the importance of finding a way to connect with people, especially those people that are in high stress situations, how important it is to acknowledge them and recognize them. And so I'm very excited for him to join the Ripple Effect podcast. So let's dive right in. <music> Guys, just a quick real interruption to this episode. We had such a great kickoff that I didn't actually launch into a formal introduction to Ben before we got going. So you're going to see a little bit of our pre-conversation because he was talking about an event he was going to attend, which sounded amazing. And it was not something I'm aware of. And probably you aren't aware of it either. So it's worth checking out. So I just left all of this in. So wanted you to know this is my edit face. <laughs> Let's get on with the episode. Oh, success. Now we're talking. Now we're the gas. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, sorry. Sorry. I, no, that's I, right. I didn't get in. I didn't realize it would be this, you know, the, these things. So, well, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's one of those things that once you know what you're doing, it's easy. But if you yeah. don't know what you're doing, it's not so. Oh, shoot. Okay. There we are. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Once you know what you're doing, then it's pretty straightforward and, and all the rest of that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. now you'll be set up for when we do the sequel. So <laughs> <laughs> let's hope there is one. Yeah. Well, hey, great to great to meet you face to face again. You know, and have this opportunity doing? to, you know, uh, you know, have you on the podcast. Uh, I, like I said, we're it says we're live, but we're not. I'll, I'll uh, record all the or edit all this out. But do you have any questions for me before we get started? Not really. Um, I'm choosing just to let you know, heads up. I chose not to uh, do a whole lot of preparation and just kind oh, of let, okay. it, let it unfold because, um, well, like lots going on. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're about to leave, right? I mean, going out of town. I had uh, head to uh, Maine for a conference uh, for a week. I'm home for two days, two and a half days. And then I'm in Argentina for three weeks. So is Argentina a work trip or a fun trip? It's a, it's a fun trip. Oh, nice. Got friends that live there and uh, going to spend three weeks in Buenos Aires and, and out on the coast and just kind of get a little bit of a, well, springtime for us. It's heading into fall, pretty deep fall for them and yep. uh, enjoy, just enjoy the, love the culture, love the people, love the my friends that are down there are amazing. Oh, so, that's going to be great. That's fantastic. You know, and what's, the conference, what's the conference in Maine? It's uh, the great, it's the great mother, uh, conference that was originally started by Robert Bly about 50 years ago, okay. Robert Bly the poet. Wow. And it's a big, uh, uh, you know, arts, uh, poetry, storytelling, um, just all manner of really fascinating people show up. Uh, you can look it up online at the, the Gr Great Mother Conference. And then uh, you, you take a look and see what they what their agendas are and uh, it's just a real eclectic group of people that get together and and um, create 
six, seven, eight days of uh, just kind of unique community. That's great. Unique connections. I mean, it's what's real fascinating for me to to have your your website and the work you're doing here about you know building community, building connections, allowing those connections to actually, as you as you so succinctly put it, ripple outward and touch uh, more people's lives and and hopefully bridge gaps that are. Uh, you know, existing in our culture and in our society that, uh, you know, we do, if there's anything about what we do, we do it better together than we do it alone. Absolutely. I, you know, I actually did a, another interview this morning. I don't know if you know, um, the, the name Carol Costello, she was on CNN as an anchor for a lot of years. Yeah. So she was my guest this morning and we were talking about that same thing. So she's a professor now at Loyola Marymount, um, in teaching journalism, Mm-hmm. And just how challenging that situation is now, right? And and just what a crazy dynamic our country is in, right, at this point, and how necessary it is to try and educate, you know, these this next generation about how to have conversation, how to engage and connect, and it's completely foreign concept in a lot of ways. Well, this is something that uh, a couple of friends of mine and I are chewing on together, and um, you know, in my world, I do deal a lot with uh, imagery and things like metaphor and story and, and all the rest of that. And I came up with this uh, phrase, uh, concretized metaphor. Say that again. Concretized metaphor. Concretized. I'm not even sure I can say it correctly, let alone spell it. (laughs) (laughs) And essentially what it is, is it's, it's a, there are two words that don't belong together. Okay. So what happens is if you think about metaphor as a, um, you know, it's certainly a literary tool, a linguistic tool, but it's in its essence, what it is, is it's the ability to make the leaps of connection. Yeah. In ideas, in um, imagery, in uh, perspectives. And do so in, you know, what, what, what one, one friend of mine called the leaping consciousness. So we deal a lot in our society, in our, in our culture with allegory. You know, this is like that. Yeah. You know, we do, we do a lot. You know, that's like this other thing. Um, in metaphor, you make a different kind of connection. This is that, you know, kind of a simplistic, uh, you know, an, uh, analogy might be to use the phrase, you know, um, Susan runs like a deer. That's an allegory. Right. The metaphor is Susan is a deer. Yeah. So if you can, you can feel how that resonates in the body, the connection is immediate. You don't have to draw the picture to the way that metaphor brings us together. That's right. And then, yeah. and then it ends up being this living, ongoing, living connection to the ideas and the connections that we all actually have. And when you concretize those things, you take out, you're still you, you might be using this language, but you take out the livingness of it. Okay. And so this is a constant, uh, I think, you know, we, you know, talk about educating young people, educating people in general is if we can choose to educate how we can live into our relationships and into our place in the world, then the world becomes dynamic and connected and interconnected. Doesn't mean that we don't make choices. Doesn't mean that we don't have our opinions and, and, uh, You know, doesn't mean that science and, you know, the the logic doesn't exist. It just means that we are going to engage in those things in a living manner and allow them to continue to teach us. A good dynamic conversation unfolds. Yeah. I get to know somebody and it might be I've known somebody had conversation with somebody for 20 or 30 years and I still learn new things when I'm in a in a healthy, dynamic relationship with them. Yep, absolutely. So these are the things that I like to to cultivate. How do we cultivate a living, breathing connection with the world that we live in? And this yeah. includes everything, you know, you know, more than people. I mean, go spend any time you want out in the woods or on a beach somewhere and watch how the, you know, just take time to really settle in and watch how life unfolds around you. Life doesn't stop just because you, you <laughs> because you've frozen your place in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's in, so this, this conference is, is really about bringing that all together. Yeah. I so we'll that. work with, you know, in the conference, we'll work with stories. So the storyteller, uh, a fine gentleman named Jay Leeming, he's going to tell a version of the Mahabharata, which is an in a Hindu epic tale. Um, if anybody's heard of the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata is this great grand epic 
And then the Bhagavad Gita is a little piece of that epic. And so I'm not sure what Jay's going to do, but he's going to take this larger story. And there's just profound, amazing, beautiful um, journeys of tragedy and comedy and romance and, you know, uh, politics. And, and he's going to tell this over probably four or five days. Wow. Um, spend an hour to two hours on each of those days and tell a portion of the story. And then that's one aspect. And then we have poets, we have artists, we have, um, you know, different kinds of, of uh, creative people, movement. And then everybody will have an opportunity to partake in classes or small groups or, um, you know, seminars. And then just, you know, and it's all ages, you know, all everybody's welcome. And wow. uh, we'll, we'll do some. You know, who knows what comes up, but we'll do some fun stuff. <laughs> that, oh, that sounds amazing. And is this an event that happens every year or? Every year. Okay. Every year. Like I said, for 50 years now, it's been happening wow. every year. Uh, some of the guys out there will have heard of Robert Bly and, and for example, um, Iron John, the book Iron John that he wrote. And out of that came uh, a group called the Minnesota Men's Conference, which was a more, that's focused on men, but also story, poetry, um, you know, that sort of thing. And that's been going on for 30 some odd years, 38 years, I think. And I've been teaching at that conference now for 10, 10, 12 years. Wow. And we do story, same thing. We do pretty much the same kind of thing. And, and uh, pretty interesting to get a bunch of guys, you know, you yeah. and realize that when men can like, let some of the guard down a little bit and let yeah. some of the, allow a little bit of uh, warmth to come into their relationship, some pretty amazing things can happen. And so, you know, this is something that uh, we've been, in, I've been involved in for quite a number of years and, and really deeply appreciate. Well, that that's fascinating. And I, I was originally going to just kick us off and just introduce you, but we're off to the races already. I mean, <laughs> let me just say, welcome to the ripple effect podcast. Cause there's no way in hell I'm cutting any of that because it's just brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, I'm yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I, I'm 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 super intrigued about that experience. Like you said, bringing men together in that environment where they can you know let down their guard, mm -hmm. you know, remove some of that bravado and actually have that experience collectively. That's got to be one of the more powerful things. That I I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It, it's, it can be a challenge for some guys because, you know, you push at your, your limitations, you push at the expectations. Um, most of us are, are accustomed to, you know, going to the pub and watching the game and, you know, being out on the you know baseball diamond or, you know, you, you know. And what I would say is that in men's, you know, general men's experience, what we do there is much more akin to grabbing a buddy or two, take a fly rods and go out on the river and take some time on the river. Yeah. You know, or, you know, in the hunting camp or or out hiking, doing a photo of photo safari, something where you're connecting with something bigger than just your your daily life, but actually touching in on something that's grander than that. And so when you bring in for for human experience, when you bring in poetry, you bring in story, you know, a lot of the stories we work with have been told around the fire campfire for, I don't know, let's just say 10,000 years. Yeah. You know, whatever that means, you know, when you see when you hear a storyteller say 10,000 years, it could mean it started last year. It could mean it actually started 10,000 years ago. <laughs> but there's something that's that, that touches us. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we've all sat down and watched Disney and we've all sat down and watched, you know, some of these these movies or read novels that that elements in there just resonate. And when you start studying where some of those images images came from, you realize it's like it's been in the human consciousness for generations yeah and when you get to build on that beauty and build on those connections you know something 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 moves something has the opportunity to move you know you're invited it's an invitation to move beyond the limitations of what your what your daily life gives you so let me ask you how did how did you get so plugged into this. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you, you have a really interesting background and we'll come back to kind of a little bit of your origin story, but I'm really fascinated in terms of how, 
I, I loved on your website, you, you call yourself a, a mythologist. I, I kind of butchered that in the, <laughs> in the intro because it's a hard word for me to say for some reason. It's not in my common language, right? But what is that and how, what led you there? Because I think obviously that piece of the storytelling is, I'm very fascinated about that. And like you said, it opens so many different avenues for connection and conversation with other people, but also with ourselves. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, for me, it has to go back to childhood, dramatic childhood, single parent, you know, lots of upset, you know, big story there that, uh, you know, could be gone into at a different time, uh, threw me into books as a way of escaping. I mean, there was times between junior high school and high school where I was reading upwards of two, maybe three novels a day. You wow. Know, granted, we're talking, you know, Robert Heinlein science fiction. You know, we're not talking, yep. you know, we're More not reading, piece, right? the, <laughs> I'm not reading the Iliad and the Odyssey in a day. But uh, yeah. you know, I was just constantly in the books because that gave me the escape that I needed. Yeah. And that led me into my first forays into college. I loved literature, uh, dropped out because of resources because, you know, I, you know, I didn't have, I came from a family with no money. Yeah. So, you know, I did a couple of years, managed to turn that into uh, enough start. And then between military, uh, working everything from the oil fields to restaurant business to, you know, even tried my hand at being a uh, stockbroker and ended up in the fire department um, for Seattle. And what the fire department did is it gave me time. So we worked two 24 hour shifts a week and I had five days a week off. <laughs> And then I started, you know, I hit a real dark night of the soul towards the beginning of my career. And I was introduced to a couple of guys, one of them named Danny Deardorff, um, astounding individual. He's since passed away, had polio. But Danny was a storyteller and a musician, wrote a book called The Other Within. And um, he introduced me to this idea of storytelling. And I was painfully shy, socially awkward. Probably still am, even in, now that I'm in my 60s, I'm, I can fake it a little better than I used to. Um, but that gave me an impetus, and I started looking at, I want to do more than just slinging hose over my shoulder and, yeah. and uh, putting Band-Aids on people, which is first aid and firefighting was, was my career. And so I started cast around, and one day I ended up looking at a place called Pacifica Graduate Institute. It's down in California, and they are a they had a mythological studies program, master's Ph.D., Wow. And something just clicked. And so I jumped in. I started school. I managed to go full time school, master's PhD while I was a firefighter. And when I completed that, I, that's when I was invited to teach at, uh, you know, I teach taught at Antioch University. I've, I've uh, done a number of different sem seminars and um, workshop kinds of things and ended up uh, with the Minnesota Men's Conference, which uh, led me to the Great Mother Conference. And I started telling stories. Wow. And, um, you know, it's it's that's sort of the, the linear trajectory. The inner journey is journey is much more convoluted than that. I mean, a much deeper, uh, more circuitous route uh, brought me to this fascination with the idea that we live honestly, each of us. It doesn't matter what our what our background is. Each of us lives a grand life. Yeah. Now, it might be it might be a lot of tragedy in there because we certainly know that might be a whole lot of success might even be, you know, certainly is all for all of us. I think on some degree, there's a lot of longing for something deeper, yeah. but if we recognize that our life is grand and live into that back to what I was talking about before, of letting our relationships with the world be living, it opens the door. And that's what I call the mythological context. So I was a mythologist. That's what I'm after. Each one of us lives a mythological life in the sense that, there's the truer, deeper, you know, one of the definitions of myth is the truer truth. Now, the, the sort of the contemporary thing is myth, that means falsehood. Well, that's one way to look at it. But the deeper way of looking at it is that there's a truer truth that's, el that's elaborated in the images and the connections that we make that don't make logical sense. Yeah. And so that's what, that's the, as fast as I can say it, what that means to be a mythologist. So, so, so the story and work with the connections. Yeah. I, I love that. Could you give an example of sort of one of those, I mean, connections that you, you made, you know, to once you've sort of discovered this, how, how did you, you know, how did that come to light in your life? 
Well, for example, in uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales, there's a story called The Devil's Sooty Brother. And in that story, there's a soldier who's wandering the land and lost. And he finds himself finally away from people, find no place to rest, ends up in the woods, and there's a uh, meets this dark man. And the dark man, you know, it's sometimes it's the green man, sometimes it's the devil, whoever, sees that he's uh, in his condition and says to him, he says, if you come and service me in the underworld and down under the earth for seven years, and in that seven years you do, I give you a task and you do it. And uh, during that time, you do not comb the tangles out of your hair. You do not wash or clean your fingernails. You do not wash your clothing and you do not wipe the tears from your eyes. A man, young man lost from the war goes in there and there's when he arrives into the underworld, there's a cavern with three great cauldrons and inside and the, and the dark man says, feed the fires under those cauldrons and keep them boiling. But whatever you do, don't look inside. And if you do, your life will be forfeit. Wow. <laughs> okay. There's the invitation. I'll save the rest of the story for you to go look at, but but I can see already you've got some chills. Yeah, yeah. Who of us has not been wandering the land, feeling destitute inside, so hungry that we have to go into the darkness and contend with something that makes no sense? Yeah. And so I read that story, and that started working out. I probably told that story in its completion 30 times, 40 times, 50 times. And each time a new part comes up. And so in that story, he has to make his journey through breaking the rules, through gathering gold, through going back out into the world, having everything that he had, had that he had made stolen, have to go back into the underworld, re, re you know, fill his pockets with gold. And go back out and of course it's a Grimm's fairy tale so there's a happy ending <laughs> um, but what happened for me was the resonance of that touched my own experience was it you know this it wasn't again it wasn't allegorical in the sense that you know this is you know this is like that but I, I resonated with those images and so when I went forward especially when I started working with veterans first responders that were struggling with PTSD and that sort of thing when they tell a story, that story or a story like that, you could see the recognition in the room. Yeah. You could see guys. I mean, I remember one time, one of the first times that I did a conference, it was a veterans conference up in upstate New York. And uh, vets, combat vets, PTSD, these guys, every kind of, and there was one guy in the conference room. He arranged some couches and some pillows and blankets and went behind the couch so he wouldn't have to be in the circle. Really, and, and I talked to his therapist, and his therapist, who who brought him to the conference, said, "Yes, you know that's the way he is. He won't participate, but he'll listen." And I told the story over three days. You know, so it's, it's a longer story, but you just got the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And by the second day, he was looking over the couches. Oh, and by wow. the end of the second day, into the third day, he was in the circle fully present both physically as well as attention span because something in that story touched him well enough that he could now break down his resistance the the heavy duty ptsd allowed him to step forward and be part of the circle oh wow so that's powerful you know and the therapist came to me after the conference says that's the most amazing thing that gentleman has never done that before that's so amazing Another, we put the pieces together, not by my, you know, I didn't have a technique. What I did is I created enough through, you know, there's a, one of the person that uh, Michael Mead talks about, uh, the old Irish poets that would come and they would throw images into the room and the images would transform the space. So that's the power of words, the power of imagery. And those are the things that, that we did. It was, it was amazing. And then, of course, there are some conferences where everything fell flat on its face, but that's what we did. <laughs> Don't talk about those, right? But no, I mean, I, I, I imagine they probably didn't to the degree you thought they did. I've been there where I thought, oh, crap, I just didn't hit it on all notes there. But then somebody will come back and say what you said or what you did or that story you shared really made an impact. I mean, it, you know, 
I, I cannot personally, um, having, you know, spoken to you previously now watch the video that you sent me from, um, you know, the, the Western Massachusetts, right. Um, yeah, Western Massachusetts union society. Yeah. I mean, I can't see you ever falling flat. So I don't think <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there's not a chance, you know, I think that, I think, I think you're, uh, you're underselling it. Right. But, um, at the end of the day, it's it, the story is what connects us, right? The ability for us to uh, find something that we pull out of that, and that that allows us to bring something to the table that we can we can share and we can partake in together. Exactly, and that's uh, that's what it's all about. Because ultimately, it's like yes, there's an old myth, you know, Grimm's fairy tales, you know, an ancient Hindu epic, or you know, the a section from uh, the Odyssey, or or you know, some other. Ancient, ancient or Shakespeare or whatever, but ultimately it opens the door for our own story. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I recognized in the, in, you know, those stories is that the old stories give us an arc. And so in that arc, we can find a place where we, you know, maybe belong, but because you have the whole arc in the story that's told mythologically, you recognize that I'm not stuck in that place. So from that image that I gave you from the first story, the devil's sooty brother, he's in that in that cavern feeding fires for seven years. Mm -hmm. Who of us has been in a cavern for seven years feeding fires for God knows what? Yeah, yeah. And that sense of timeless hopelessness. However, in this story, we find a whole nother trajectory that's inclusive of leaving that place, drawing gold, because that's one of the images from the story that later on that the the dark man comes and says, go behind the door where you've been sweeping the ashes and fill your pockets. Hmm. And when he goes back out into the world, he goes to turn, you know, he's carrying ashes in his pockets. Why would he do that? As he goes to turn his pockets out, he looks in and realizes his pockets are full of gold. And how much of us have these horrendous, amazing, tragic, romantic, beautiful, horrible stories that ultimately don't become the gold that we carry out, carry into the world. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when you're doing your work and you, I, I know, you know, obviously coming from uh, a role as a first responder, you, you certainly have experience in that. I, I you know, I, your story that you talk about um, in the talk that you shared with me with about coming back to the fire station and before you, you know, saw your girlfriend, you wanted to wipe the blood off, but you were thinking at a high level about that life, what that, you know, what that experience was, which I, I, I found just, it didn't leave me. And I thought about that for a few days after, after hearing it and how you shared it, but how do you equip these, these stories um, and, and the mythology when you're dealing with someone that's, you know, dealing with the stresses of being a first responder or having come back from, you know, military, you know, uh, operation or war where they've got PTSD and they're dealing with these things. How do you help them break through to see themselves within that story? I, I think I understand it on the high level, but I'd love to hear just kind of how you kind of, because it to me, I think you're probably really, you're not forcing it. You're sort of just offering it up and people are figuring out where they connect with the examples and the stories you're sharing. Well, you know, there's two things, you know, in the storytelling aspect, the, the process that I use um, that was, again, you know, I'm stealing, you know, all, all poets and artists are thieves. Yeah. You know, they have the imperative to improve upon what they steal, but they're still thieves. So, you know, one of my uh, teachers, one of my friends and teachers uh, talked about uh, this idea when you tell a story, the story feeds us. Now, in the context of the storytelling circle, we feed the story. And so each person in the room is invited to then give a piece of their own personal story that's evoked by, by the, uh, the telling of the story that they've heard. One of the things that I added to this is as I started off, said, like, where in your body did the story resonate? Oh. And so we bring in the somatic aspect, which is the other part. And so when we start recognizing, wow, I could feel it on my belly or, you know, there's, you know, I get, you know, the, you know, that moment that, that this happened, I could, you know, right in the back of my neck or, or in my throat or, and then from there, they start unfolding, untangling the, the hold that some of these experiences have on them. And this isn't a, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, you know, an instant cure here. This right, is a, right. 
long journey. The other thing that I do is, is I bring a, you know, for lack of a better word, a ceremonial or ritual process to this. And so at the beginning of like, say a veterans retreat, um, I have the guys create, okay, create a gateway and go out there and give them, you know, whatever materials there are. And then when a gateway, however they make it, it can be sticks, it can be piles of stones, you know, branches or whatever. And I tell you what, put a bunch of guys at work doing something that doesn't make any logical sense with the imperative that they make it beautiful. Pretty cool things. Start yeah, happening. They'll excel at it. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so then we go outside and then we make a concerted, entry into the space that we're occupying and recognize that when we are in this space together in the circle that we're not um we're not part of the world out there but we're not completely separated from it either right and then when we complete the 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 weekend or or the conference we make a journey back out and we leave that as a contained part we can always return in our memories to our time there the other thing that I do is I have people build a shrine or an altar or however you want to look at it. I don't want to get be careful about not getting into the whole religious thing, but just sure. recognize that we're going to go create something. And one of them that built the beauty and one to grief. And it's the same thing. Go in and create a shrine to beauty because whatever we do, it does, you know, men can do beautiful things. You look at the great artwork of the world. How much of that's created by men? Mm -hmm. So men have the capacity to create profound beauty. Human beings have the capacity to create profound beauty. It's not just men. When I do veterans work, it's, it's pretty much, you know, so far it's a pretty exclusively just men for, you know, try to keep the, the tensions somewhat limited. And then uh, one to grief. And grief is a real interesting thing because that has to do with contending with the things that were potentially deeply wounding to our soul. So when that happens, how do we how do we work with that? And so in the context of the mythology, they put their hands to something. They make something beautiful. Sometimes it's sad. Maybe they, you know, grief uh, shrine might be a, a hole in the ground that you can go scream your your and throw your tears into the hole in the ground, surrounded by flowers, because you know that it has to, it's something generative. You know, it's like every you know, every opportunity that we have to be able to shed ourselves physically of the weight of what our experiences are, just like when things are profoundly beautiful. If any of the, any man that's ever fallen in love knows what it's like to dream up something beautiful to do for the person that they're in love with. Yeah. And how often do we, you know, look back when you were young, it's like, go back, a, a, an old girlfriend of mine from my time in the military, shoot, that's been over 30 years now. Uh, she wrote to me, I, I, I kid you not, three days ago, showing me a box of the letters and cards that I had given her that turned up in her. And I'm just like, wow, I forgot about that. Yeah. And then, you know, she read a letter to me and I was just like, I wrote that. Where did that come from? <laughs> so we have this capacity for profound creative beauty. So why not tap into that? Yeah. Why limit it to a kind of a logical progression and allow the, the, the dance, the poetry, the, you know, the flower to bloom. And so in the story, we help push away some of the weight of the moment into a large, you know, something that's much larger than ourselves. Recognize that we're on a journey, you know, this and we and today I'm at this point of the journey. But I have all of the rest of this to go on, be able to create some beauty be able to contend with and confront the deep grief that I have and then allow the rest of my life to be generative, be creative, make something amazing. You know, whether that's, you know, like I love, I love looking at your website there, you know, it's like you're bringing people together in, in these profound ways. What a beautiful, what a beautiful gift of the world that is. Oh, thank you. Know, you. One of us has, has this capacity. Yeah. You know, we somehow, um, you know, we talk a lot about it. You know, I have a friend that wrote a book uh, called Tracking Wonder. His name's Jeffrey Davis. And it's, it's a really good book. And it, it talks about our um, our young genius and how we just, we somehow lose it, right? Coming into our high school years and we stop dreaming. We stop, you know, stop envisioning what we really want. And we just fall into the categories and the boxes that we think we've been pre-assigned and sort of, you know, to your point, 
the the story hasn't been written and there's a there's an arc that we still have the ability to impact in terms of where we want it to go and what we want to do and but if we're not playing an active role or we're not um you know being a a committed participant in the story and we're just letting the story unfold rather than playing a hand in helping us narrate or write it um then we we really lose something significant I, I- I love what you just said. That that to me, this idea of being an active participant in your own life. Well, I mean, it's like what a simple thing and how beautiful and how often have we forgotten that? And how often do us older guys, you know, encourage that in the young guys? Right. The young young men, young women, the the young they thems, however you want to look at that. It's like how often do we encourage their own active participation in the life that they're leading? Probably, probably very little, but when we do, to your point earlier, right, when we do these things and we actually see the impact that we have, I mean, that's the ultimate ripple, right? We're rippling on behalf of somebody else, but at the end of the day, that ripple comes back to, to us as well. It re- re-inspires, it reinvigorates, re-motivates us mm-hmm. to want to continue to do it. it and it's, it's sad. We only do it in certain circumstances or maybe not at all, but, you know, when we do do it, uh, it, it's, it's those rare occasions. And to your point, um, we could do that every day. We could find a, a way to create beauty every single day, whether it's in our relationships, being a, a active participant in, in our worlds, or just figuring out how to get a little bit more centered inside. Exactly. When I started, first started teaching in college, it was Antioch university does a, uh, an evaluation process. They don't do grades. And uh, I figured out pretty early on that most students get a lot of negative reinforcement in, in their schoolwork. So they're focused on all of the questions that they missed in the test. They're mm-hmm. focused on all of the things that they didn't do right in the essays that they've written. And, and uh, they're constantly paying attention to what they didn't, didn't get. And I realized I wanted to do a, be, be a cheerleader. doesn't mean that I can't correct language that, you know, writing that needs to be worked on or, or if they've missed a point. But what I can do it from the perspective of look at what wonderful work that you've done. And I can tell you now, I have, I have students that have that have come to me years later and just said, you know, yours is one of the best classes. I didn't learn a thing, but I love being in the class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet they learned a lot. I, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious there, you yeah. know, self-deprecating. But uh, what I realized in my own life is that I responded much better when somebody came along and said, hey, great job. It made me want to do more. Now, were there times that I had to tell somebody who's like, you know, stop walking and run? You know, love being yep. on fire grounds and, and the old chief is sitting there watching me, uh, you, know, you know, and then give a little bark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Encouragement there, but, in a different way, right? Yeah, you know, a little, a little uh, positive encouragement there yeah. to, to get moving yeah um, but uh, at the same time that same chief would sit down and talk with me you know over the over the dinner table and share some experience and you know it's like when it came time to do work you did work uh, so I learned a, a profound work ethic in that regard um, and when it came time to take it easy and and soak up a little bit of wisdom from the old guy it was there too yeah. And so that's what I, that's what I tried to impart when I taught and then oh. same thing now. So I love giving young guys encouragement. In fact, the, one of the roles that I have of the conference coming up here is that uh, I'm the point person for all the young people, the teenagers that are going to be there. Yeah. And I do, I'm a, I do a lot of work around fire, for example. So I have, you know, flint and steel and bow drill and do, you know, these kind of goofy little things that I've learned along the way. And, Boy, I tell you, you get some 16, 17 year old kid that's that's, you know, hoodie down to here, yeah. you know, barely, uh, barely present out of the own angst that he's got. You put the opportunity to make fire with flint and steel. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And it's whatever you choose to do, whatever is going to pull somebody in or wh- whatever they resonate with. You know, there's just so many opportunities out there. And why wouldn't you take an opportunity to have the world be a better place by the people that you touch. Yeah. But 
you know, you have to find that flint and steel in everybody, right? Whatever that is. And then you have to use it because it's not one thing just to discover it, but it's actually to apply it and utilize that as the, you know, the opportunity. It's because that's, that's the door opener, right? That's the invitation to, you know, pull the hoodie back and actually see the kid for who he is and what they're Mm -hmm. about. And that's true, whether it's a teenager or whether it's somebody in their, you know, sixties or eighties, right? At the end of the day, it's trying to it's, it's a lost art form. And I really applaud the fact that you're bringing this to the surface and, and having more and more people get exposure to this concept and this idea, because that's, that's what we really lack is our ability to do that. And we're, we're all inspired or motivated by something, but very few of us actually take the time to figure out what that is in ourselves, let alone anybody else. Right. I have a one, one quick story. Uh, I went to my 40 year uh, high school reunion you know, was that five years ago, five, six years ago. And it was really amazing because we went there and, and kind of surprising how many people weren't, were still, were not alive. It's, that part was interesting. But looking at all these guys walking around and kind of like everybody's sharing about what they were doing. And, and I watched this dynamic of, I start telling people what I'm doing and eyes would glaze over. <laughs> and then, and then they start telling what they were doing and they get all animated. And after a while, it's, you know, we did our photo, we had some dinner and, and when it was all over, I walked away and I had this profound realization because I walked away feeling a little disappointed. Mm-hmm. And then it dawned on me, the missed opportunity. What would have happened had each interaction that I had where I asked the question and then listened? Yeah. Because they, all of us, we want to share our own story, but how much of a gift is it to be able to ask the question and then listen yep. and genuinely listen and let that be an invitation for somebody to come into this space? You know, that, that, that you know, what's the old classic old thing? You know, it's like God exists in the space between me and thee. Yep. And, you know, what happens when the divine shows up, when you open up the door to let somebody step forward? And, I tell you, I've struggled a lot in my life about, around that, and I'm, I hope I'm finally getting it. Yeah, I well, I think you are without question. I think so. <laughs> I, I I now have a new high water mark that I want to start to be like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you you said something in in one of your talks, the you know the talk that you sent me, but I also think when we first initially had the conversation was, um, I can't imagine. And how you start that. Could you share a little bit about that? Because I I think it really is a perfect segue to what you just said in terms of how we actually figure out what that is to engage other people, trying to find that commonality, trying to find a way to understand the other person, get their story a little bit. And it, 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 it really is a lost art form. Well, I, this came in, in early in my, in my teaching career and, um, I heard somebody we were, it was a, a class that I was taught. The class was uh, titled war in the soul. And so, you know, you're looking at the, the extreme human experience of war or war and warfare. And my, one of my early, early on in there, somebody said, I can't imagine. And, and then I realized it's like, I hear this, maybe not a lot, but I hear it a fair amount. This phrase, I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. Well, beginning one of my classes, I got up on the board and I wrote, I can't imagine in, in quotations. And I looked in the room, you know, how, you know, the, the students there and I said, okay, raise your hand if you've ever said that. Okay, everybody said that. And cause we've all said it. Sure. And then, um, then I asked the class, I go, now, is it true? Is that a true statement ever? Is it a true statement? No. Nope. And people was like, um, yeah. <laughs> And really, is it true that, yeah. that we can't imagine? And then I said, the truth is that all of us can imagine. Now, your your imagination may not be born in the reality of the of what you're hearing, but you can imagine. That's one of the profound things that human beings have is the capacity to imagine. And when we open the doors to our imagination and then let that imagination free into the room, 
but don't hold on to it back to the beginning of the talk about concretized metaphor. If we don't make it a concrete, a concrete, well, that's just the way it is and lay the judgment, but allow ourselves the openness to let that imagination then be informed by more and more stories and other people's imaginations. Now, a huge opportunity comes. Yeah. So, for example, somebody might tell me of some, you know, I don't know, let's just say epic experience. You know, talk to, you know, one of the, you know, John Glenn's first time going to space and sit down and have the and and ask and say to him, it's like, wow, I can only imagine. Can you tell me more? Mm -hmm. We open the door. I can't imagine. Can you tell me more? Open the door. If you say, I can't imagine, you've just closed the door, right? Yeah, you're right. You know, back to another part that I talked about with vulnerability. And there's this interesting thing about resilience and vulnerability. I spoke to you earlier about Yeah, that when we allow ourselves to open up, our ability to be vulnerable and open to intimacy, there's risk in there, actually in, in real life leads to greater resilience. And this, uh, when you listen to that talk, it was uh, about resilience and vulnerability. And the, the idea of resilience is that it's flexible with the capacity to return to its original form. So a spring is resilient because it goes back to its original form, but it can be deflected. It can be moved, put into all different positions. Human beings are the same way. All of us have some measure of resilience to us. We all can adapt. But the more that we can bring in and the more that we can hold with our imaginations, the greater level of resilience we have. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> I really love that. I, why do you find that it's so difficult? And I'll use a general generality here, but why do you find us as um, human beings challenged to be vulnerable? And then specifically, why do you think men have the bigger challenge in a lot of ways? Well, you know, there's certainly we can go into the biology. You know, men are the ones that run out there and contend with the lions that are attacking and that sort of thing. And we do need to have capacities to deal with, you know, through 100,000 years, we've had to deal with a lot of things. So I think uh, um, there is a, an imperative, but I also think that it's a huge cultural thing that says men should be like this, women should be like that. You know, you, you, you know, if you sh show your emotions, you know, you're going to be, you know, that's going to make you weak. And so we have these stories that, that have closed down the imagination, that have closed down our capacity to receive, you know, firefighter, it's really interesting, you know, so a little bit of a segue here. Firefighters are a much higher risk of suicide than police officers. Hmm. And the only thing that I can, you know, there's a whole lot of research out there, but the one thing that I can say sort of anecdotally is that firefighters have a whole lot more hero projection from the community than police officers. Police officers still have hero projection, but they're, they're the stick versus the carrot. So everybody has the idea that firefighters are, you know, this, this you know, great, affable, adapt to anything, there to help, et cetera. But the truth is, we're still just human beings. Yeah. And so to to the question about why this is, I think that we have built stories that say that men should look this way. I love that word should. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, not, I we would should ourselves to death all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Word should shouldn't be excised from the language. However, we should have a good understanding of what it means and what the implications are. Yeah, I think there's a big cultural piece. I also think there's a biological piece that that, you know, it's kind of built into us. Certainly not everybody, but to some degree, men want to protect what's, you know, under their purview. Yeah. Any family man with children, you know, it's like, I don't care what the circumstances are. If there's a threat to, you know, mom and kids, it's like, you want to see the warrior come out? Yeah. Do that. You know, granted, I might not uh, put the, that warrior up against a mama bear, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there's this idea that when men come together, it's like the capacity for men to be intimate with each other is, is you know, it's difficult at best. Yeah. You know, because uh, we have this idea that if I have weakness, if I show anything that can be perceived as weakness, I'm going to be, that's going to put me at risk. 
but then don't we also have images of you know the crusty old firefighter you know trying desperately to save a kitten out of that's you know from smoke inhalation or holding a baby or we've got uh, you know soldiers we've got generals we have these images of hugely powerful men weeping yeah now we like those because they've got you know they were you know that's a kitten and it's okay but uh, i've also seen men weeping over the injury of one of their fellows mm -hmm. or um you know in ecstasy at a concert or um completely captivated by some image of beauty and so when we can allow those things to come in and not be limited by the cultural imposition that says men should be like this and you know, that, that sort of thing that that's the task we have yeah. if we have a task in life that's one of the tasks is to be a feeling sensitive human being in a world and and also have the capacity for everything else you know warriors are a uh, warrior society in Japanese war in Japanese samurai culture you didn't become a full samurai warrior until you had mastered an art oftentimes that art was the art of healing hmm. so you couldn't take up the sword until you also knew how to heal the cut you couldn't take up the capacity to do battle until you had mastered the capacity to do to create beauty and even in, you know, ancient knighthood, you know, courtly, courtly uh, love, along with, you know, the capacity for knighted battle, you know, it's like if you weren't a poet or had the capacity to present beauty to the to, you know, your beloved, then you didn't have the, you know, you couldn't put on the take on the the pageantry of the knighthood. So you know, it's in us in the grand scheme of the culture but we've sort of distilled this down to where you know you have to be buff and tattooed and and mean and tough and have lots of money or or you know drive a fast you know we all have this sort of external imposition yeah. of what it means to be a human being what it means to be a man um so I can, I can keep going on and I probably have missed the mark, but. Uh, no, you didn't. No, it's, it, it made me, it made me think about, you know, when I see, you know, I host these events called eight minute ripples, which are networking for non networking people. Right. And you have reason I, I wrote a book on networking and I hate networking. Right. You know, it's, you know, part of the reason is because it's all, you know, pop and circumstance and it's, who's got a better elevator pitch and it's, you're putting on airs. Right. So when we hold these ripples, we say, Hey, no, uh, no elevator pitches, no business cards, people come. Uh, and you think, well, what are, what are they going to talk about if they can't talk about, you know, their, their professions, we try and take away anything that denotes any kind of status, right? Where you went to school, can't talk about that, where you, what kind of car you drive, where you went to, you know, how big your house is, nobody cares, right? So you, you put people in a room and then we have these ripple connection questions, which are fun to ask and fun to answer, but they're really designed to help you derive a connection point. And what I've actually mm -hmm. found is that it's, it's the men that come in with the bravado and, you know, the, you know, they, this is the dumb thing. Why am I going to do it? And they're the ones that we have to go pull apart when it's time to switch partners because they're exactly. so deeply engaged. I think that there's a legit hunger for, for that, you know, that connection, that ability to, to have that heart to heart, belly to belly conversation with another person, but especially if it comes from, you know, a male talking to another male where there's no prejudgment and there's no, Having to put on those airs, it mm -hmm. is like a freeing experience. I've had people that have come in. We had um, we hosted one after Katrina, and we had a guy that came in super, just real aggressive. Didn't really want to follow the rules. I had to go remind him a couple of times. Hey, look, you know we got to do it this way. And then when he actually finally got into the flow and connected, they we came back in what we call adult swim, kind of a way where we can share, hey, what are our needs? What ripples are we willing to create for someone? What are we willing, you know, what do we need personally? This man who had just been kind of an ass the whole time, but was starting to get better. He just broke because here he was in a town he didn't know about. Somebody told him about this event. He needed a job. He needed a more permanent place to stay. His wife was eight months pregnant. They'd lost everything. And it just came, you know, completely out of him. But mm -hmm. 
people stepped up to help him in such a way because they connected with him and his story once he got past all the BS, right? You know, and of course your life is up and in. There's, um, you're, you're entitled to be angry at the world in a lot of ways, but it was the power of these people coming together for him at that point he could not speak because he just couldn't believe because somebody said, Hey, I know exactly a place that, you know, needs somebody with your skills and abilities. And somebody said, Hey, I, I've got a, a cottage house that you guys are welcome to stay in. And I've got a place that we can, you know, help you get food and do what you need to do. And it was all because of this really crazy networking event. Somebody told him to go to, and it was the, the power of it was just palatable. Right. And I see it in a lot of different arenas, but that one stands out to me because this, this guy, I wish I had stayed in contact with him and they moved on from Austin to Houston and then God knows where now, but he did tell me, you know, three weeks after he went, he's like, that was the greatest decision ever because I finally found, found like I found my people, my tribe. Exactly. This is, you know, this, this is directly one of the things that I observed, you know, we have this culture of, of uh, apocalypse. You know, yeah. we look at all of our, our films and all the rest of it, you know, it's like the breakdown of society and all the rest of that kind of thing. I've been around a lot of disaster in my life. And I'll tell you one consistent factor is that when disaster shows up and you don't have an external force involved, but, you know, natural disaster, people come together. Yeah. And when you trust that, when you, when you allow yourself to trust in the openness, that doesn't mean that, that bad things can't happen. But by and large, people will work together. They'll come together. Um, even in the big ones, Katrina, for example, there's tons of stories where people yep. came together and took care of each other and made sure that everything was okay. Now, <laughs> the government might have messed it up really bad, but uh, the people themselves did pretty darn good. Yeah. In the face of, of extreme limited per, um, um, resources yep. and and uh, an overwhelming force, external force in nature that came along. And I see this all over the world. I mean, I've, I've been going to Argentina here uh, next week, and I'll spend three weeks in Argentina. It's one of my places that I like to go. I love the place. But they're huge economic troubles. They've got, you know, they certainly have had some issues. But you go into the towns, and you go into where the people are gathering, and they help each other. They work together. Um, coffee shops are full of people talking. You know, it's like there's romance on the street. There's dance on the corners. And you know, yeah, it's like like any place. It's like somebody might pick your pocket. You know, somebody, you know, some things happen because that's one of the other realities. But it's that, you know, what I like to see is like we have a tendency to legislate. And by that, I mean, judge and everything else to the 5% at the sacrifice of the 95%. Yeah. And 95% of the people out there are going to be going to have your back. Yeah. And yes, of course. You got that 5% where somebody's going to, you know, do something unexpected that you don't like. But by and large, people pretty much take care of each other. Yeah. People will step up. And it doesn't necessarily take beer and a pizza to get a pickup truck to show up. But, you know, people, people do. So, you know, if we cultivate that, how much better is the world that we're in? Oh, absolutely. I agree 100%. Well, I, I could talk to you for hours and we may have to just do this again. I am so grateful that you agreed to do this, but I, I'd like to finish up if you're open to it, um, with just asking you some ripple connection questions. Okay. And we'll see. We'll there are no on. gotchas, I promise. But you know, I got, you know, I, it just gives our audience a little bit more insight and I know everybody's going to be fascinated. You know, I, I highly encourage all of our listeners will share your, your links, you know, at the very end, but, um, just your root just your approach to writing and, and how you uh, do your, you know, the storytelling aspect, it's just fascinating. And so I, I, we will definitely have to have you back because this is just, um, this has been a thrill for me. It really has. So let me ask you, where do you find your inspiration? Boy, that gives chills. Um, first off, I love nature. So every, just about every single day I'm out in the woods and, that's the, that's the backstop for me. And the ability to reset on a daily basis is huge. And then, uh, in, and then beyond that, in my connections with my, my fellows, the, the men and women and uh, the people that I know um, and, the, and the connections that they bring forth are incredibly inspiring. Conversations like what you and I are having right now, um, 
give me the breath I need to keep moving. I love that. That's great. Um, we met because of Ted Rubin. So I have to ask a ripple oriented question there, but how in the heck did you and Ted Rubin ever connect? Well, as you know, Ted, he's a, you know, he and I have quite a different personality, but uh, it all came about, I was a ski bum in Vail, Colorado, and he was a young and up and coming businessman. And he and his buddies showed up. Uh, I worked at a place called Vail Ski Rentals right there in the foot of the mountain in Vail. And uh, he was looking around trying to figure out, you know, he and I struck up a conversation and he couldn't figure out where to store his skis and stuff so that he didn't have to cart them from the condo all the way up. And I said, well, I got a ski locker downstairs. You guys can use that if you want. And no, no expectation, no money or yeah. anything like that. Just an offer, you know, hey. You Be know, nice. Cool. Yeah. Be yeah. nice. And then uh, we, from there, started skiing together and pretty soon uh, a friendship developed and that was in nine, the winter of 1984-85. Wow. So that's almost 40 years now that Ted and I have been friends. That's great. And you guys get together every year to ski? Just about every year oh, we, we yep. get together. That's so. cool. That's a really cool uh, That's it, that's That gives me chills. Um, <laughs> what are you reading these days? I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> um, I've got uh, a stack of books over there, but uh, The Dawn of Everything by uh, um, Graber and Ren Rengro. Okay. Um, it's an anthropological book. And then I'm also reading, reading The Myth of Normal by Gaber Mate. Huh. And then uh, I'm rereading uh, my friend Danny Deerdorf's book. In fact, I have it right here. This one's amazing. If you, oh, you can... Yeah. Take a look yep. at that on uh, Amazon right now. Okay. This one's a challenge to read. Okay. But uh, I'm going through the myth of normal that right now is really moving me because he's really talking about from a medical, psychological, medical, and social uh, perspective of, of what are some of the myths that we, you know, not the mythology that I'm talking about, but right. the, the things that we maybe need to revisit. Yeah. Um, those are three that, that stand out for me right now. So, so not much has changed since your, your youth. You're still reading three books at once. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I'm honest, it's at least that many at once and yeah. uh, probably more. So I have a, yeah, I like to, I like to read. I, lo I love that. So <laughs> let me ask you that. I, I think I saw it on that book, but when you do read these books, I mean, are you someone who dog ears and highlights or underlines? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I went through school. I started off with highlighters and pens and pencils, and now I use a mechanical pencil and I keep my marks to a minimum so that uh, I've, if anybody's tried to read a highly uh, highlighted book, it's a pain. But uh, the pencil can be erased and, you know, I can jot a note. But, yeah, my books are used. Good. Loved. They're well <laughs> As they loved. should be, right? As they should be. I've got friends. It's like they don't want anybody touching their books because they want them perfectly pristine. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> one other I'll, I'll, I'll put out there if you're into poetry or yeah. want to explore poetry it's called the rag and bone shop of the heart okay so it's, it's an anthology by uh, james hillman the psychologist michael mead the storyteller and robert bly the poet pulled together po um, poems from around the world and from spanning a huge amount of time and um highly highly recommended that if for any anybody that doesn't have that collection of poetry or you you want to explore poetry? That's that's a tremendous book to start with. Okay, yeah, you know I'm I mean? definitely going to check that out for sure. I appreciate Good that. Good to have on your shelf. Yeah, absolutely. What's the best piece of advice you've received, and how have you found yourself using it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I mean, it goes back down to you know, learn to listen. Yeah, learn to listen. You know, when you're when you're caught in a in a tough situation, learn to listen. Because in the listening, there's always going to be an opportunity. And that was probably the best, best advice that I had. Oh, that's great. You know, let your, and in there, hidden in there is, you know, get, let, let yourself get out of the way. Because, yeah. That's great. W what would you consider your superpower? <laughs> that one, I, you know, talking. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I think um, I, I, I know that I wrestle with a persona that uh, can be kind of tough, masculine, whatever, however it is, what people tell me. 
um, but honestly, it's a, it's a compassionate heart. Um, yeah. it, it really came to forefront when I f- was first a firefighter and, uh, I was downtown Seattle, a lot of homeless people, a lot of drug, drugs, alcohol, you know, all the stuff, all the usual human things. And I realized I caught myself, um, taking on the jade that a lot of people take on. Yeah. And I just made this, I sat down one day after a long shift and I just said, I'm going to make this commitment. I'm going to do this job to the best of my ability with an open heart. And it, it's, it's tough, but, you know, I would say that if there's anything, you know, that I can claim it's, it's that. That's great. That's a great thing to claim for sure. What, yeah. So you, you've, you've touched a lot of lives. You've had a lot of ripples in, in your life. Um, what would be the best thing, someone that you treated, someone you worked <laughs> with, someone that served with you in the Air Force, someone that was, uh, you know, at the fire station or maybe one of your students, what's the best thing you could hear one of them say about you? I don't know. Gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you yeah. for having them, having their back. Because, you know, it's like even the people that that I didn't get along well with, you know, I, I, uh, I always had their back. Yeah. You know, even, even, if, even the enemy, I, it's, to me, it was just important. And if that's recognized, that would be a huge, a huge thing for me. That's great. I love that. What's the most important thing in life? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm getting visions of, of the princess bride. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, I think, to be honest, you know, all, all joking aside, I do think love, but in a ever unfolding realization of what that means. Yeah. It's not Pollyanna. It's, 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 it can be harsh, painful. It certainly has a lot of grief creativity, joy, uh, connection. But if we don't, uh, we don't hold on to the fact that we love deeply, then, then in my mind, in my estimation, um, we're, we're handicapped. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, last two questions. What does the ripple effect mean to you? <laughs> that's what we're it, engaging with this conversation and, you know, talking with Ted, cause he mentioned, he talked a fair bit about you and So it's the idea that when I touch, when you and I touch, that you can then go and touch somebody else's life. And then from our conversation, I'm going to carry this out this way and that way. And and the more people that we touch, the the bigger and more connected that the world is. Yeah. And, you know, back to what I was talking about at the very beginning about this idea, we don't do anything alone. That's right. I like the analogy of picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. We've all heard that. It is a physical, metaphysical, and ontological impossibility. Go try it yep. in any way, shape, or form. We don't do this life alone. No. Nope. So the ripple effect is is the embodiment of that. Oh, that's a great answer. I love that. Well, what ripple can I be looking to create for you? Share this with people and... and uh, if we can keep the conversation going, you know, between you and myself yep. and, uh, and then whoever else wants to join in. Absolutely. That done. That's easy. We're going to, we're going to make that happen. Well, I'm not into making it hard. So yeah. <laughs> I'll take an easy one any day. I love that. That's fantastic. Well, Ben, for my audience, how would you like them to best, you know, learn about your work or to follow you? What's the best way to do that? Um, my website, I also, uh, I post on Instagram. It's, uh, you know, Ben Dennis at, you know, like 8167 or something like that. Um, if you do an Instagram search, you're going to see, I do a lot of photography, mostly flowers. One of my crazy uh, habits when I go out in the woods with their disturb area, I always have a pocket full of wildflower seeds with me and I scout our wildflower seeds. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I just figured it's like logging, all the rest of that kind of stuff. It's like if you can spread a little beauty around, why not? Why not? Absolutely. But uh, Instagram and, you know, I'm on Facebook and and uh, my website, bendennis.com. Um, and then, you know, shoot, shoot him my email. Yeah, I'll include that in the, in the uh, show notes if that's okay. That's perfectly fine. 
Fantastic. Well, uh, Ben, it has been an absolute honor. I'm so grateful that you agreed to do this. I'm so grateful that I, you know, thanks to Ted's Instagram, I saw you noodling one day and I'm like, what's he writing? And that, <laughs> that's what kicked <laughs> off the question. And he said, but Ben, who knows, right? He's a, he's a deep well, exactly. <laughs> and I, I just said, well, you know, I need more deep thinkers in my life. So that's, I said, would you be willing to introduce me to him? And I think he was like a little suspicious, like, why you don't, you know, but yeah. I, I knew there was a story there with you guys skiing and just, he actually, when he and I met uh, at an event, um, he came down uh, for South by Southwest, invited me to the event. And he was telling me about going skiing, you know, with this friend that he had met, you know, many, many years ago. And he was so looking forward to it. To me, that stood out at the time as someone that, you know, that, that, that really meant something to him and that, that meant something to me. And then when he posted your adventures um, uh, on the ski, it definitely looked like a great trip. But um, when he, he had that one post where he came down that morning and you were just off in the corner you know, writing something, um, it really stood out to me. It, I don't know why it spoke to me, but I'm so glad it did. Cause you know, now we've struck up, uh, you know, the beginnings of a great friendship. So. Well, thanks Steve. I really appreciate the, uh, the willingness to reach out and, and, uh, engage. Cause this, you know, this is what it's about. Absolutely. That it's we're, we're all in this dance of life together. So, you know, might as well make it interesting. That's exactly right. I agree 100%. And I can't wait to hear how the conference goes and the trip to Argentina. So we will definitely have to get a call on the books for when you return. But I just want to say thank you again. It was an honor to have you on the show for sure. It's a, it's a real privilege and a, and a pleasure. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Guys, we'll be back again with another episode of the Ripple Effect podcast. But until then, be sure to check out Ben's links. And as always, Ripple on. Thank you.